And I'll start by um, acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia. The QMS recognises the continuing connection to lands, waters, fungi and communities. We pay our respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, last minute change of plans, unfortunately. So Vivian's um, found herself in a bit of a pickle. She wasn't able to present tonight, unfortunately. So uh, instead I'll be doing the foray results uh, for 2021. So 2021 has been an interesting year. We've had really high hopes. Um, it's, it's a La Nina year. So you always expect that big things of a La Nina year, but given the, the preceding years, I think it's been underwhelming in that sense. A couple of forays have been particularly dry and unproductive, uh, but it is important for us to still go out to sites, uh, even if it's not going to be a crowd pleaser, um, because we're trying to get our head around negative records. And it's important for us to go to a site and record that there is nothing there, um, as unexciting as that might be. So we still enjoy a good day out, as always, whenever we go on a foray. And we enjoy the time we spend with each other. So it's all very good. Um, Kalula National Park was our first foray this year. That happened on the 13th of February, 2021. And it was a big turnout and we were very excited, but it was particularly dry. Um, we had a little bit of rain, so hoping hoping for good results, but the day wasn't as we'd expected, unfortunately. As you can see, the site, Kalula's up near um, Noosa on the Sunshine Coast, the place that we foray. And as you can see, there's uh, the, the relic of a fire there, which was probably about 12 months prior. And of course, the preceding year, which was extremely dry. So there was a lot of catch up with the ground moisture and um, also with the fire as well too. That being said, we did find a few things on the day. So we found a Amanita afrubescence to start with, which was a nice find. And we had a couple of mycophages. A mycophage is someone who eats fungi and um, they were telling us that they've eaten Amanita afrubescence and that it's a delicious edible. Um, as we know, Amanita rubescens, which is an Amanita that grows in association with pine trees, it's a lovely pink specimen, is a highly prized edible and is quite delicious. Interestingly enough though, it's toxic raw and it's delicious cooked. I wouldn't suggest anyone go anywhere near Amanita when it comes to eating. It's too fraught with danger. Any sort of white gilled mushroom you'd steer clear off, but you know what they say, there are old, there are bold mycologists and there are old mycologists, but there are no old and bold mycologists. Anyway, we had a couple of bold mycologists along on the day and they were telling us that they had eaten Amanita afrubescens and that it was quite delicious. So that was news to me. Uh, we found a lovely little bowly, was our second specimen. And it had lovely sort of paws on the underside. It was uh, a nice specimen. We. We don't have an idea on that one on this stage, unfortunately. Um, no, no, the specimen's literally uh, on on the on the desk with a lot of notes and no work done on it, as is too often the case with uh, a lot of our forays. We collect specimens and we people don't pour in the resources afterwards to to do the work to to um, try and identify them. So. There is a real lag there. And I've got about five boxes of specimens on my floor at the moment from last year that are still awaiting work to be done. Number three, again, a bowly. That's the bowly in dissection. Of course, we know that in the field, we always dissect our bowlites. Uh, we need to observe staining qualities. And this one didn't stain at all, as you can see. Um, but it was another lovely, robust specimen and it was in very good condition. Some Pycnoporus we found on the day and a lovely Felinus, beautiful specimen, perhaps something an artist would want to paint. Um, and we didn't find too much else. In fact, Patrick Leonard remarked that it was one of the most unproductive forays he'd ever been on. Um, 
fiddle dee dee So we did find this last specimen. It was a, a very dried up old specimen. It was all up this tree. Uh, they were very past their prime, so it was hard to really do anything else. It was a beautiful day though, and there were lovely other things, lots of other things out. This beautiful, uh, it, the name escapes me now. And sorry. Divisio, pea flower, pea flower, yeah, okay. And we did find, interestingly enough, because we don't, we, we do keep our, our, our um, blinkers off. We look around for other things and other biodiversity. And uh, with regards to iNaturalist, I entered the following thing, a Drosera peltata, which is a stipitate Drosera. Uh, you know, does anyone know sundews, Droseras? So it's a carnivorous plant. And you'll see the little, the little sticky, the little sticky, Drosera, oh dear, excuse my spelling, it's D-R-O-S-S, D-R-O-S-E-R-A, Peltata, so I'll correct that later on. But you'll see these are the little sticky globules which capture animals, and it's actually stipitate, and it's about 10 to 15 centimetres tall. I'd never seen one before, and um, one of the young people that was there on site um, found it, and it was a beautiful specimen, so I've added that to night. I naturalist. I guess if you're thinking of Drosera with an S, you might typically think of something like this, which is what was on site already. Um, and I can't remember what species that is, so I just left it at genus. But that's typically what I would think of when I think of a sundew or a Drosera. So that was lovely, this beautiful stipitate Drosera. So we saw a few other things. We saw one other Ganoderma on the day as well. And we made a collection, but the collection was for Vivian because it was quite infested with insect holes. So hopefully she's had some meaningful outcomes in the mycetobiont area. Our next foray was uh, Main Range National Park and that was on the 27th of February. This was the foray from which everyone got scrubbage. So as you know, before we go on a foray, we send out the workplace health and safety document People kind of roll their eyes when you send them that stuff. They're like, oh, I'm a bush. I know what's, you know. I, and um, I threw caution to the wind on that day because I'd run out of um, DEET. And I thought, oh, I'll be okay. I'm, I'm covered up, fully covered, you know. But of course, we were on our knees, on our hands and knees all day and rummaging around in the bush. And I got home Saturday and I was a little bit itchy. And then Sunday, I was really bloody itchy, horrendously itchy. And then I had all these red dots all over my body and it was scrubbage. And of course, it's just so awful. I had to sit in a bath for an hour to alleviate the itch. And then you hop out of the bath and after your skin cools, you have to paint yourself with the paintbrush with uh, a scabiole or lie clear and then take a quantity. And I mean a quantity of antihistamines to try and alleviate the itch. Then I had to work from home on Monday so I could periodically run into the shower to deal with the itch because scratching them is not the way to go. Anyway, um, prevention's better than cure as is always the case. So DEET up and have a good look at those workplace health and safety documents before you arrive on site. They tell you about important things like stinging trees, um, how we, what we do in the event of a steak bite and ticks as well. DEET's really good for preventing ticks and tick outcomes are probably the worst thing that I've seen in the society. So it really is better to, <laughs> well, you would think, you would think I was, I was, I guess I was on my knees a lot and sitting on things. And that's the real connection I find is people say if they sit on a lot of logs or, or sit down places throughout the rainforest, that's when you get scrubbage. Um, so yeah, deep, you know, I guess you don't know how well it's working until you leave it out of the equation and then you find out, wow, it is working <laughs> because this is the first time and the last I'll have scrubbage, I have to say. So it was a beautiful, it's a beautiful spot up in main range. Cunningham's Gap, Mount Cordeaux is the specific area. Just stunning rainforest and we always find terrific things there and today was no exception. We found some really lovely specimens. This Merasmus hematocephalus which was a beautiful observation. We didn't have to collect it. We just observed it and put an, a dot on the map, hopefully with iNaturalist. Um, we found some beautiful Philoporus. 
Now, they're actually a bowl eat, just to mix things up and make things a bit confusing. They're a bowl eat that has really strong cross venations between the gills. And apparently the cross venations between the gills are the relics or the remains of what was a poured fungi. Um, and you'll see what we've done here too, is we've actually scratched it to look at the bruising. I typically find with Philoporus, it takes about 60 seconds for your bruise to occur. Now you'd think with something like that, would anyone care to guess what color the spore print would be? Good, good, black, brown, we're not going for yellow. I guess the, the novice would say, oh, it's got yellow gills, it would probably have a yellow spore print, but it's not at all. Interestingly enough, the spore print is identical in color to that bruise. It's olivaceous black, really dark, beautiful spore print. So Philoporus, um, a lovely specimen. I think a lot of work needs to be done in Philoporus. If someone wants to specialize or pick up an, a group of fungi and work on them, I think Philoporus are crying out for attention and it wouldn't be a world of pain, I don't think. How many species do you think, Fran? 12, 20? It's, it's, it. Mm. So Fran was saying they're so recognizable and indeed they are, they have those quite bright yellow gills. Immediately you can put these into genus just by looking at the suede top, the suede, like suede boots on top and the yellow gills. So it's not a genus that's like Cordinarius or Amanita that has hundreds or possibly thousands of species in it waiting to be sorted out. It's a nice small little genus that would maybe have between 12 and 20 species. Who knows, maybe there's a, a plethora of species there, but um, the work needs to be done. And of course we did collect and observe this Marasmus. We thought was new and interesting, but Fran put that fire out when she did the work on them and said, no, it's just Marasmus elegans. And maybe, okay. Oh good, <laughs> maybe not. So Franz has said maybe not, but... Um, and then of course we had uh, this, which I would call uh, Udimanciella. Udimanciella, you'll see it has the taproot, that little taproot. And now we find out it's Hymenopelis, okay, is what Fran is telling me. And then of course we had these lovely things. Now at first glance, you might think these were um, Zolariaceae um, or something else. But of course, when you cut them in half, you learn very quickly that they are in fact Daldinia concentrica. And in dissection, you'll see, you see how they look a bit like a, a lump, a brown or black lump, like a Zolaria. But in dissection, you'll see that they have those lovely concentric circles. Um, I don't know the colloquial name, it was King Edward's Cupcakes. King Alfred's cakes, King Alfred's cakes or cramp balls. Okay. I don't know where that comes from or how it makes sense. A <laughs> cramp ball. Okay, so apparently I'm getting feedback from the audience here to say that cramp balls, um, if, if you put them under, in between your legs, they, Oh, okay. Hundreds of years ago, they would alleviate cramps. So I'm not sure if they actually work, but that's the feedback I'm getting. They're cramp balls. Daldinia concentrica, beautiful things. Really hard to dry though, because they're so thick and juicy. You really got to almost cut them in quarters or leave them on the dryer for extra long. I've lost several collections because I thought I've dried them and then they've been infected by mold. Okay, and um, this log over the river was covered in these beautiful white fungi, which um, are Udomanciella. Now, I thought they were Udomanciella mucata at first, but of course, Fran promptly informed me that Udomanciella mucata have an annulus, and these don't. So this is probably Udomanciella exannulata, which means without an annulus, and they don't have an annulus, but they have that lovely um, sticky cap and they were plentiful there on the day, beautiful. We also found a really lovely stink horn, a little mutinous, and those tags are two millimeters, or tw two centimeters or 20 millimeters, just to give an indication of size, tiny little things, and also an egg sac, which we dissected. We could have hatched that incidentally, if we took that little sack home, they're really easy to hatch. 
So if you find stink horns in your garden and you want a, a hobby or a, a project for the kids to do, you can say, hatch these eggs and then they'll be, oh, they stink. We did collect it, yes. It's still on a shelf at my place waiting for notes and depositing at the herbarium. But the specimen was collected and we were very careful to collect the very specific things that you need to. Uh, how, do I how do we preserve them is the question. And the, the answer is that what we do is we dry them. Yeah, they have to be dehydrated. I guess there's various methods of preservation. You could suspend something in alcohol. Um, dehydrating is probably the go-to method for fungi, but it has to be a very specific type of dehydration. You don't want to destroy DNA, which you will, yeah, yeah they, they, they stink up your laundry. <laughs> I was about to mention temperature. So I've just had, I've just had a question and a remark from um, Susan Nellis about temperature and dehydration. And it's a really good question. I guess uh, if you were gung ho, you'd, you'd dry them at 50 or 70 degrees. Of course, at 70 degrees, you destroy the DNA. So you do have a good dried specimen, but it won't be good for DNA. Um, I mean, ideally, if you're doing DNA, you're doing it from a fresh specimen but you can still do it from a dry specimen if it's been dried appropriately. So I believe you would have to dry it at 30 degrees Celsius, which is really quite hard to do. You might have to couple your dryer with uh, a dehumidifier in order to dry properly at 30 degrees Celsius. Otherwise you probably need to do what I do is go up to 40. Now 41, 42, 43, you're kind of crossing a line with regards to DNA preservation. Um, now that's gonna be challenging to dry things, particularly in a humid environment at those temperatures, but that's what you want to need, you'll want to do if you want the DNA to be intact. So if you are doing the DNA off a fresh specimen, then you could probably go up to 50 and just dry the specimen and not worry too much about having intact DNA if you're already doing the DNA work elsewhere. So just FYI. Um, incidentally, for, for these little mutinists, there are specific things you need to record, like is the tip open? And if you have a look at that picture there, you'll see that the tip is open. And then we need to look at how it connects to the stipe. Is there, is it sheathed or is it smooth? So you'll see it has like a little hood and a little hangover. Um, so those are small details that are really important. So when you're taking photos, that's why it's really important if you don't know what to get in the field, to get a, like that every angle sort of photo. You can't really take too many photos. And then someone will go, oh, wow, I'm glad you took that photo because the dried specimen, I can't tell, but the fresh one, I can see that the end is open and I can see that it's actually hanging over the, the, the tip onto the stipe. Um, sometimes a cross section of, of, so you need to cut it across and have a look at the how it's made up in cross section as well too for stink horns. That's cage, fungi, phalluses, mutinous. And that's the feedback we have from Vanessa, who's done a lot of work in stink horns. And this was, of course, I think I've already done a brief overview of this foray, so I didn't wanna, I'm just giving you the good stuff, really. Um, this was a um, lensites. And of course, lensites underneath are just beautiful. So when you turn them up, you see that wonderful bifurcate gills and they're just amazing to look at. We saw a few other things on the day, some really lovely, what I would call perhaps a caprinus. These weren't collected incidentally, but they were beautiful. I've never really seen a yellowish caprinus, so we could have left something significant behind on the day, but we often do that. We run out of time. We have to put our blinkers on and walk past specimens that may be of scientific note, or we only have the capacity to collect up to 30 specimens on the day, and even then, that may be just one or two people afterwards drying and processing, which means they don't get the attention they need. They just sit on a shelf. Then they end up at the herbarium and then maybe in six to 12 months time, if we're lucky, someone who has the time resources to allocate will pick up the specimens and try and work them through a, a, a key and do the work that's required on them. So 
that's a really unsatisfying, I think, I guess, about doing specimen collecting and going on forays is sometimes we don't have the resources to allocate or to devote to identifying what we found. And quite often we leave things behind and someone says, oh, did you collect that? That's amazing. We're like, no. Or we do collect it and then we find out years later that it was fantastic and that there's no records yet of it in Australia, so it was significant. So there's all that sort of stuff happening. So a good day is a great day, but when you are overwhelmed, it's kind of gut-wrenching to think that you're leaving a lot of stuff behind, which is amazing. We saw this lovely little, what I would call a leucocoprinus, um, which often comes in a yellow form, a common pot plant fungus. This is a white form. And it had some lovely exudate at the base of its stipe. So it was kind of a you know photographer's paradise, that one cover of... National Geographic, if you're so inclined to sit there for an hour trying to get the exposure right. We saw some geastrums, which was lovely, because I haven't seen a lot of those around this year. So it's always lovely to see geastrums. And I would call these geastrum triplex. Fran's giving me a nod in agreement. And geastrum triplex, typically they're about, these. they're quite big as you can see, that's a two centimeters. So they're about bigger than a 50 cent piece. And they always have that sort of cracking and that breakage around them and a double layer is what Fran is saying. So you'll see the, the first layer and the second layer, first layer, second layer, and uh, beautiful display, really lovely specimens. And of course, what we always see there is um, Mycena liana. Var Australis. This is my Sinaliana Var Australis. We see, we always see this year, year after year. We don't often see it many other places, though. I have to say. And there were, of course, some really lovely tiny specimens of white fungi. And again, the work hasn't been done on these, but I thought these were just delightful. I saw these a few weeks before at another park with uh, with Judith when we were on a foray. And the thing was, they're so tiny, and there's only two, and there were, there were only two here and two there, that we couldn't really make a meaningful collection. So we just left them behind because they're so small. And with something that tiny, you really need 30 to 50 specimens. And that's what we got. So we made a really good collection of those. I'm really anxious to hear what the outcome is with the ID on those, because I think that'd be interesting. And we found some wonderful slime mold, Hematrichia circular which looks like forbidden spaghetti. Um, really beautiful stuff. And that was a really, for a hematrichia, that's a, a decent sized specimen. I haven't seen anyone that large before. And just a lovely looking thing. More geastrums, of course, on the day. And that was that. So that was a really good day out. And we were hardened again, because after the results of Kalula, we were like, oh, wow, there is good stuff around, which has to be the right conditions, like, you know, five kilometers up in the altitude and then inside a deep wet rainforest. It's the one, it was the one next to the amenities block that went north. No, no. So there are a few tracks there and unfortunately we only did a small section on the day. Again, it would have been a great day for a great place for a, a residential foray, spend a day or two on the site and the various tracks looking for stuff. So there were beautiful lichens around too. Mapleton National Park, Linda Garrett track was a good day out, but unfortunately I wasn't there for very long. I had to leave after an hour or so. So I handed over the reins to Patrick who led the foray. But again, it was a great turnout and it was a terrific day out, I believe for everyone. We saw some beautiful stuff like these, um, Anyway, I should have named it. I don't think a specimen collection was made of these, but you can see this is what we call cross venation that, uh, that between the gills. And that's, um, that was a beautiful specimen. We also saw some colostoma. Um, and we were having a bit of a laugh about it on the day because someone had a botanical Latin on board. Does anyone know what colostoma directly translates to as? No, it means arse mouth. <laughs> colostoma, as you can imagine. Colostomy bag, colostoma, colost. <laughs> well, maybe he got his, his Latin pretty mouth. Oh, okay. 
so we had our Latin askew on the day and we we're having a bit of a laugh about it. Pretty mouth is the colloquial name, of course, for these. So, <laughs> and um, these, would anyone have to guess? Resupinatus, that's what I would thought of too as well. Yeah, little Resupinatus, tiny little grey and then had that central gill formation. Beautiful little things. Uh, I'm not sure if a collection was made, but I hope so. And we saw some Cantharellus on the day as well too. And, and some, uh, this is Anthracophyllum archery, which is a, a beautiful saprophytic fungus. It occurs on twigs at about, I guess, one to two centimetres in diameter. And it has that, what I would call a terracotta top exactly like a terracotta pot and underneath those beautiful burgundy gills, wonderful color combination. So Linda Garrett's always a great site, but wasn't wow on the day. John Oxley Reserve was on the 27th of March. And that was a great day out again. We're having really good turn ups to forays. We're always completely booked out and a lot of people. So it's a great walk and talk, if nothing else, and just a great day out in the sun. And John Locksley Reserve was pretty good. One of the interesting features is it has mangrove on site. So it's, it's one of the only, well, one of two areas where there is uh, a mangrove habitat that forms part of the ecology. So that was always interesting. And in fact, the first thing we found was down by the mangroves, which was this large specimen at the base of a mangrove. That's the underside, no name as yet. We also found some lovely slime molds. I would think that's um, the dog's vomit slime mold, possibly, no, no. Okay, I'm getting a nod. No. Uh, and another slime mold as well too. So that one was plasmodial, still moving around, mopping up bacteria. And this one was fruiting and fruiting bodies. I think they're different slime molds though. So we did make a collection of this one. We found a tiny little pyzolitis and made a good collection of that as well too, which was a, a nice specimen. And saw some lovely mycelium with gutation, like little jewels. There was a rustula. And with all the talk of fluorescence in the forest, We've now extended our hack knowledge, our Rustula hack knowledge in the field, because we know that Rustula and Lactarius used to belong together in the same genus. Now they've been separated out. One of the interesting things about Rustula and Lactarius is typically with the Lactarius, you cut the gills and it will produce milk and you go, oh, okay, I've got a Lactarius, not a Rustula. So that's kind of the way you would tell them apart in the field. I guess you have a really, well-trained eye, you wouldn't know a Rustula straight away, someone like Patrick Leonard or someone who's done a fair bit of field work. Um, but the other one, interesting way to tell them apart, of course, is that Rustulas fluoresce and Lactarius do not fluoresce. And we've been testing this in the field and we found it pretty much to be true. This one did, it fluoresced, which is kind of hard to tell in the daytime. You've got to get around and put it in darkness and in shade. And then you, you put your UV light and then you'll see that it lights up in the same way that the white paper on the marker also lights up. So it did fluoresce, which said to us, okay, maybe there's something in this Rushillas do fluoresce versus Lactarius that don't. We also found a beautiful Amanita on the day. Again, no work has been done on this one. Vaginata group, yes. Yeah, so I think it would I think it had that snake skin stipe. And of course, when you dig them up, the important thing to observe is the sock and whether or not the sock is gray or white, and that will pretty much get you to species immediately. The other indication that Fran is now telling me is the plicate or striate cap. These were very old philoporous specimens. And again, distinct by their yellow gills and that suede like boot leather top this was a um, scleroderma, possibly. We cut it in half. You can see the spores inside a lovely puffball. And then we did also find a lactarius. So we, we cut the gills. And as you can see, because it was an old dry specimen, I would call that lactarius eucalyptii. I've got two nods of agreement. John Durnley would know, and he's agreeing. 
but you see that with the with the lac with the lactate thing, they don't always produce a lactate if they're an old dry specimen or if they're too young to produce lactate. So, um, and typically, if you did have lactate from a lactarius eucalyptii, it would be kind of mild to bitter. It wouldn't be spicy or nondescript. You would get a kind of mild bitterness off the lactate. That would be the other confirmation you get. And of course, it's uh, mycorrhizal and in association with eucalyptus trees. One interesting find was this we found on the day. Um, I wouldn't know where to begin with it. I don't know uh, if it would be called Tricia or uh, Amaroderma, but they were lovely specimens. So interesting. Have you seen anything like it? No, neither have I. And so, yeah, you get that kind of exciting feeling that, oh, I wish we'd done some work on this because I'm sure it would be interesting. So the specimen remains with work to be done on them. And then of course, some clavarioid fungi, little um, tendrils on the floor of the forest. We did find an agaricus. So any guesses at first to what that might be? My first guess was agaricus rotalis, which has changed its name, Fran is telling me. So I don't think it is, but um, we, we did a nice dissection of them as well too, and they really stained yellow, and they smelled very strongly of Windex or window cleaner or they had that very strong phenolic kind of chemical smell, um, which is a test of fire if you're eating wild agaricus. Of course, you'd need to identify agaricus or field mushrooms to species. And um, if you can't do that, you wouldn't eat them, but the test of fire, I guess, is to cut them and smell them. And if they stay in yellow and smell like chemical, they're probably going to make you sick, at least if you're not able to tolerate phenolic compounds. I don't know why you'd eat them, but they stink horrible. Some agaricus when you cut them. And these, of course, Marasmus pellucidus, we collected on the day. <clears throat> so not amazing results from the day. And um, <clears throat> our next, foray was Ben Bennett, which was on the 10th of April, 2021. And again, a great turnout up in Caloundra. And um, fortunately we had Pat and Fran both on board on the day. So we had some hardworking mycologists making a difference. So I've actually got some meaningful names <laughs> for this one. And this was the first one that I thought was um, something else, but Fran promptly corrected us and she did some work and she even did some spore photography and found it was Skitnapogon. Skitnapo, Sitenapogon. And um, it occurs in a, in a few places at Ben Bennett. I haven't seen it a lot in many other places, but it's lovely. And the regular features, the Scanoderma, we've just been looking at, watching it grow slowly, trying to have a look at how quickly it grows, but it was a beautiful day out. And there were lots of other things to see as well too. Some beautiful orchids and this beautiful bolete, which I've seen there for a while and I haven't seen many other places. And I've always been rather excited about it. And when you dissect it, that you get that yellow base and it has this beautiful reticulation on the site, which is just lovely. And incidentally, it has pinkish spores. Now there's not many fungi that have pink spores. So usually when I get pink spores, I think straight away that it's going to be entoloma. Or not much else because it's pretty much entoloma. And I guess there are a few other things that have pink spores, but this also has pinkish spores and it's a bolic. And it happens to be Australopilus palumanus, which is in the tropical fungi of Queensland field guide. So we needn't have wrestled as much as we had. We should just had our field guides out, but a beautiful specimen. And there are the spores, which I believe Patrick got photos of, or was it you, Fran? Patrick, yes, thank you, Patrick. A few other things on the on the day, we saw some thief spiders, well, I did, uh, Agarodes, which I thought were rather neat. And we found some really lovely looking hygrosci wax caps. And of course, with wax caps, you know, you, you put them up to your lip. It's like putting a candle to your lips. It kind of has a tacky, almost sticks to your lip a little. 
and they passed that test, that field test for a high cyber wax cap. So one of our members took it home and are working on it as we speak, have been working on it for a while. <clears throat> there are lots of other little critters along the way. It was a great day out. And then of course, this what I would call Amanita farinacea. Um, farinacea, farinaceous means, uh, farinacea, I think the Latin means flowery. Incidentally, I've heard that they're supposed to smell like dough, but it didn't smell like dough or yeasty, but they leave your hands covered in like a flower-like substance, Amanita farinacea. I do have a photo of the top. There were, there were a lot of remnants on top. And again, if you touch them, they, you, I'm being asked about the description of the cat. That's right. <coughs> I didn't put all of the photos in because I've got a, about a hundred photos in the slide, unfortunately, but um, it does have a, uh, a lot of uh, remnants on top. Um, if you, I can pull those up for you later, if you like, no, give you a look. And again, I think, I'm not sure about the, did we finish up with Hymenopilus for this round? Yeah, Hymenopilus trichophora. And again, I would have started with Udomanciella gigaspora. But apparently the name has changed three times. So is Udomanciella gigaspora a valid synonym? Possibly. Okay, but of course, I think Udomanciella gigaspora is an overseas name. Um, so this has changed, it's now Hymenopilus. Trichophora, and it was occurring in the in the little trunk of a tree, like in the wood litter there. And when we pulled it out, of course, had that distinctive tap root that tapers away down the bottom. You wouldn't call it a root, really, but it looks like a tap root. We saw some cantharellus as well, which were lovely. And this little bracket that I've been wrestling with for a while. Well, when I say wrestling with for a while, I mean doing nothing with for a while. I've collected it and just left it there, but had no idea. So it was good we were able to follow up. Fran followed up with Matt Barrett, who was able to inform us that it's a Fuscoporia. Probably, fus is it Fuscoporia? Yeah, Fuscoporia gilva or Australiensis. Probably Fuscoporia australiensis. Uh, lovely little specimen with a, a kind of a khaki rim to it. It's velvety. And that was about it for Ben Bennett. Chermside Hills. Chermside Hills was up there with Kalula for being a non-productive foray in terms of what we found on the day. It's a beautiful site. You have a lot of these native Australian grass trees. So it's a really lovely site to be on and very beautiful, but uh, it was just dry, 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 nothing there. We did find a little one of these, which are the Fran, the olive, Poor, lavender poured Hymenakaiti. No, we didn't have Fran there on the day, so I couldn't get it to a genus or species. And um, and a scleroderma. We did also find a Felinus, good old Felinus. They stick around forever. They're there after a fire even, and uh, we made a collection of that. There were a few Pycnoporus as well on the day. Um, this one, and I think what might have been a second species, but the second one was very, uh, very small and just emerging. But I thought they had kind of different forms. So two different collections of Pycnoporus on the day. A small, possibly Inocybe, little brown mushroom, and then what I would call a Cortinarius. And if you, could, you can see the, just here, that's what I would call a, a Cortina remnant. So the web breaks and snaps, and then when the pores drop, they get caught on this Cortina remnant here. It's what you find on a Cortinarius instead of what you would call an annulus on another mushroom. Okay, and that was the year to date. And what I would really wanting to talk to was the four way we just had this weekend, which was Maruchi Bushland Botanical Gardens. And, um, the outcomes were pretty good, actually. It was a great day out, perfect day. Shame there was an accident on Roy's Road that everyone got stuck in. So trying to get to site was a bit of a debacle, but eventually we started the foray half an hour later than anticipated. And as you can see, a really good turnout for the day too. Some really good, curious and engaged minds. 
And straight away it passed the car park test because while we were waiting around to go on the foray, someone discovered this beautiful Romeria. And we don't have a species on that, unfortunately, but it was almost lavender in color and had um, lovely tips. And right beside it, we found a little tooth fungi, um, which we call, which Patrick ID'd to Hydnellum orantiacum, orantiacum, Hydnellum orantiacum. And uh, it was a beautiful little toothed specimen. So that was a, a nice find. And this was also nearby on a log that was about 10 to 15 centimetres in diameter and horizontal on the ground. And this, this black topped polypore was just emerging. So we turned it over and you have this wine coloured pore underside. And as you can see, the name is Nigroporus vinosus. And it is uh, like a venosus or a wine coloured underside. And that was a lovely specimen. And don't forget too, that if you are collecting polypores, context is key. So you need to take a cut of the specimen and get a, a photo of the cross section, the context. But um, Patrick ID that and Matt Barrett uh, agreed with the ID. So that was a good, a good outcome. Um, Russula species, and I would have called it, I don't know, Russula persanguineus. Of course, it's not anything like persanguineus. And Patrick, who was there on the day, who's the Russula expert said no. And he's now confirmed for us, this is a new species. Uh, and he's, he's, the sequencing is underway. So that was exciting. So you might just look at that and go, oh yeah, another reddish looking Russula. But in fact, it was a brand new species of science. So that was exciting. And then we found this, which Patrick also identified as Russula iteruca. And we found an Austrobiletus. Um, typical of Austrobiletus is the reticulate stipe. So you might be able to see this sort of reticulation here. It's like honeycomb almost and lovely poured. They love it, drop a lovely chocolate spore print. This one wouldn't perform, of course. It didn't drop a spore print. And I would have thought it was uh, Austrobiletus lacunosus. But lacunosus has, Patrick disagreed. Uh, lacunosus has a really tacky, wet, sticky sort of top. And it didn't, it had a, a kind of reddy brown top. So Patrick begged to differ. And I guess the results are wait to, we'll wait and see the results. We usually find a lot of Australopithecus lacunosus around that area. So that's why I thought it might be just the same, but um, you never know until you put them under the microscope, have a look, good look at the spores. And um, sometimes it's a wow moment. And sometimes you're like, oh no, it's just lacunosus. We found a beautiful resupinate as well too. It was creating white rot in the timber that it was consuming. Um, no work done on that. It was also producing a lovely amount of exudate. This was Rustula species four that Patrick's working on. And again, we thought we, we knew it was a Rustula, but we thought we'll try the, the fluorescence test. So we got the UV light out just to see what it would do. And incidentally, it really popped under a UV light. Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't think, but you know that darkish, that slightly darker red brown color in the center of the of the cap turned lurid blue under an ultraviolet light. Question? Someone's asking if it smelled like shellfish. I didn't I didn't smell it. And we had the Rustula expert there on, on the day on site. And um, I believe you can taste a Rustula a little bit. You eat a little bit. And sometimes you might get a, a taste. And they're usually the diagnostics that they would do in the field. Um, I'm not aware of smell as a, a diagnostic for... Okay. I think with Amanita, we would definitely smell them and smells a characteristic that we would record in the field. Interestingly enough, it's it's hard to get an objective definition sometimes of smell or taste. So the go-to to, to be objective about smell, I find in the field is have a smell of something and go, mm, okay. And then hand it to someone else and then ask them, what do you smell? And then you say, don't tell me. And then you hand it to someone else. 
And then after everyone's hand to smell, you tell everyone says, what did you smell? And if we all say cut grass or aniseed or mushroom or dirt, that's an objective measure of test. Um, and same with taste. When you're tasting the lactate or it's, it's not very many fungi we taste and we, we don't ingest anything. We'll just taste and spit out. So Rustula and Lactarius, we don't, we're not aware of any toxic species. And with Lactarius, you, you'll cut them and taste the milk. And with Rustula, they, because they don't produce milk, you can taste a bit of the, the tissue. And they do this all the time on the, on the Facebook pages, the Rustula Facebook page. And they'll, the, the characteristics and flavor you're looking for, for Rustula and Lactarius are either nondescript, mild, bitter, spicy, and then sometimes there's a, a time measure. So it could be delayed spice. So you, you put the lactate or the material in, and it's spicy, but not until 60 seconds later. I often have a laugh about a situation in the field we had with Lil and um, we found this tiny little lactarius. It had a, a delayed spice, but it was delayed fires of hell spice. So you, you put the, the lactate on your tongue and then you wait. And then 60 seconds later, it was like, hoo, hoo, hoo. and anyway, Lil, Lil comes over and she says, what are you tasting? And I said, have a taste. And she, I said, what are you getting? She said, no, nothing. I said, have another taste. <laughs> I said, what are you getting? She said, nothing. And I said, have another taste. <laughs> I was trying to get as much lactate on her tongue within the six, first 60 seconds. And then of course I got the, the reaction. Woo! So that was a bit cruel of me, but you know, I think I needed some amusement on the day. <laughs> so the rustlers do, and you'll see there too, that that little part in the base, these kind of mildly fluoresce, but down here, the underside of the top of the gill, you can barely see it really popped white. So it's interesting. So what is fluorescence about? We, we still don't know. Everyone's asking the question. Um, it's interesting to note that we don't perceive ultraviolet light, but some animals do, some insects do. So does fluorescence have an interaction with the observation by insects or other animals. That being said, things that fluoresce actually absorb ultraviolet light. They don't reflect it back. They absorb it and they convert it into a different form of light, into a blue or a yellow or a green. So if I was able to perceive ultraviolet light and something fluoresced, which to us, we think it glows a bit when we put ultraviolet light on. If I could perceive ultraviolet light, I wouldn't see ultraviolet light reflected back from this fluorescing specimen. So it's kind of counterintuitive. It would be black to me. If I only saw ultraviolet light, this would be black. It wouldn't reflect ultraviolet light black to me, back to me. So that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. And I'm not sure if that actually means anything. And sometimes we think of design or function in, uh, in things in nature. We think, oh, it's, it does this in order to achieve this. We have that kind of flawed human perspective, but as with bioluminescence, we still don't really understand what that's about. Um, sometimes these things happen incidentally, and then in an evolutionary time scale, like I guess you could suggest that they just happen to benefit the existence or give a, a survival edge to something. And I'd suggest that fluorescence is in that same sort of ilk. It, it, it occurs and it may incidentally give something an edge or make something invisible or more visible to something. But again, it's all um, theory at the moment. No one really knows what it's about. We also found this, what I guess people were calling for a long time, Inonotus albertinii, which is in fact called Tricia albertinii that Matt is telling me. And of course, with our polypores, it's a lovely specimen. It looks like a big blob and has that little exudate on the outside of it. Um, beautiful, and uh, that's it in dissection so that we could see the context. And we also found some truffles on the day. These, Zilloromyces. And as you can see, they're producing a lactate. So they're, um, they're in that lactarius family. Um, Patrick has identified them as Zilloromyces malayensis. So this was our chance to have a taste of some lactate on the day, so we did that. We got all sorts of feedback from, I thought it was spicy to, I didn't think, I can't taste anything at all, to bitter, to anyone. Anyway, I think at the end of the, 
the argument we decided it was bitter, but it kind of had a delayed bitter. To me, it was a bit like xanthan gum that was mixed with a bit of hops, a bit bitter and gluey. Great. I've just had some feedback from the audience to say that um, taste is, uh, because of genetic differences in people, taste is perceived results in different perceptions. So that's a great point. Thank you so much. <coughs> and then, of course, we found Penicillium coca tripicola. And it was good that we had David Holdem along on the day so that he could give people a little talk about the work he did in assisting with uh, the scientific description of this specimen. And Penicillium coca tripicola is a particularly interesting penicillin, not only because it, um, it has a form, most penicillin, I think only one or two actually have like a, a coral like, a small coral like form. And this is one of two penicilliums that actually does have a form. And even when it's grown on uh, an agar dish, I think it still forms little tendrils. Up. I'm getting a nod from Diana, who's worked with David, and she would be able to confirm that. Now, the name Coca tripicola comes from the Coca tripes beetle. So we've always thought it's a very interesting that it has this one particular substrate. We've only ever seen it growing out of pick a bean palm seeds. Um, but quite often uh, when you scratch the surface, it's actually more complex than it might seem. And what I'm telling you is not actually the truth, but it's a suggestion. So the Cocotripes beetle was, was found in dissection of one of these specimens at the base of one of the barrels, because these fungi grow out of the barrels of the seed that are created by the Cocotribe beetle. And the Cocotribe beetle was found way down the bottom of the, the barrel and it was unharmed by the fungi. So the suggestion is that it's provided, and because the Cocotribe beetle may be in contact with the fungi, it may have brought it in when it's drilled the hole and then the fungi has found a suitable substrate to, to, um, to grow in. And the suggestion even might be that the Cocotripe beetle could be farming the fungus, that it could be using the fungus to break down the seed and then consuming the, the fungus itself rather than the seed in the same way that, that termites use, often use fungus to break down timber. So that's the suggestion and hence the name Cocotripe, Cocotripicola, Penicillium Cocotripicola, a beautiful specimen. We saw some Trimetes modesta, we usually see a lot of that on site and it's pretty easy to, to see. It's not at all hirsute on top and it has that very modest looking brown and white um, color variation in the cap. And then we thought we came along and found some more truffles. These little things. So we we're like, oh, truffles. And I, I thought to myself, that has that sort of that same washed out sort of pinkish color that you see in a rustula. And lo and behold, Patrick came along and he was like, oh yeah, I think it's a rustula. And we're like, no, it's a truffle. And then when we turned them over, we saw these tiny little stipes underneath, gorgeous little stipes. And um, they are in fact rustula redelii. So this was a fantastic collection on the day and a really good collection. Uh, and a, it was a great display of them as well too. So this was a really bit of a wow moment. So a great collection of them and to find them as well too. Um, so we were a bit thrilled by that. And I, certainly Patrick was because he's doing work in Rushula. So he was thrilled to be able to take those specimens home and, and get them to species. Um, Patrick argued black and blue with me. <laughs> Forgive me, Patrick, if I'm decrying it, uh, that these were Merasmus. And I said, no, they have, her, and there was only the one. So we were just really having a, having a field fight about whether or not it was Rasmus. And I said, no, and I, the reason I cited, and correct me if I'm wrong, Fran, was that the, from what I could see was that the stipe was hairy, too hairy, and the gills don't all attach. So if you can see the gills do that typical, um, they were attached, short, middle, short, attached, short, middle, short, attached, that kind of, you know, that one long, short, middle, short, long, short, middle, short, long. So that sort of gill pattern is important to observe on the underside of a fungus. And does that, that, does it, that does not, doesn't occur in my, too many gills, too hairy stem, too big a stem from Rasmus. Uh, 
So the, the person in the room that has um, Rasmus in their DNA is telling us, no, it's not a Rasmus. So there you go, Patrick, you owe me 20 cents. We found some beautiful cortinaries as we always do on site. This one had not yet fully emerged. So we, you couldn't see the Cortina, um, which I always love to show to people, um, but they're beautiful. And uh, there were oohs and ahs because we found a bright purple fungus on the day, which was a lovely thing to do. And it's always nice to find some brightly colored things and um, for all the frog photographers to, to go, oh, wow. Uh, this was a kind of a nondescript rustula. And again, you know, all the rustulas, I look, I only know two of them to look at. And I usually bunch everything else that's not them in that group of two. But there are dozens, 20 and 30, for maybe 40 or 50, I don't know, species. Anyway, Patrick was there, thankfully, and he said, this is a rustula species. But again, it's new to science. So yeah, as yet undescribed, so uh, the sequencing is underway. And then we have this, which was what I would have called Phomatopsis fei. And Matt's now telling me it is in fact Rhodophomatopsis pseudo fei. And that is the correct name in Australia for us to use for that specimen. Um, incidentally it has pink flesh. And when you scratch it, it turns pink. Beautiful specimen. Sterium austria, you can just identify it by sight. It's a leather, it's nice and thin, has no pores on the underside. It's a good one just to put on iNaturalist. You identify it to species on site, you just upload it to iNaturalist and you've got a dot in the map. So we're all richer for the experience, which is great. You don't have to do any work afterwards. And then we found another sterium on the day as well too. And this was a really beautiful one, I thought. Uh, really lovely looking. And Matt said it was probably, I think Patrick, identified it and it was Sterium strigozonatum, strigozonatum. So I get that vague understanding that the, the Latin's talking about the description of the cat, strigozonatum, beautiful thing. And again, it's a leather. So you can see that when you turn it underneath, the difference between a leather and a polypore is this is the underside. It's just smooth like a piece of leather. You can't really see any pores with your naked eye. I'm not sure what it looked like under a microscope or a lens, but um, you would put that up as a leather if you're talking about which morpho group it belonged in. And then right beside it, we found this. So I guess to the layman, you might say, oh yeah, they're kind of the same thing. Do you see how easy that would be for a layman to say that they're the same thing? So can anyone identify immediate differences? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so this one is attached laterally, isn't it? On the side, and this was also on a vertical log, whereas this one is in little rosette formations and it's growing on the top of a log, which is horizontal. So a little rosette formation. So, um, and this one, if you can see, I'm not sure if you can tell, but it's actually her suit on top, it's kind of, furry if you've got a lens up to it and um, so the form is different and we've asked the question and we got about five possibilities back and all at genus level so I thought this was interesting because I'd seen nothing like it on the day um, so I imagine that if we did a bit of work on this one that it might come out to be something pretty pretty interesting. Matt saw the photographs. Someone's asking if Matt had a look. Yes, Matt saw the photographs and he's the one that came back with five genuses as a possibility. <laughs> so that's kind of unnerving. I imagine there'd be a lot of lab work, frustrating, getting down to microscopy going, damn, the spores are different. Not that one and having to move on. A leather is what I would call this. Yeah, as you can see, this is the underside here and you can't see any dots. So I would call it a leather um, if I had to call it something. And then the other, just beside it was this really interesting little specimen. So straight up, you're like, oh, you're in that area. Is it Xylaria? Is it Daldinia? So if it's Daldinia, we know from the specimen earlier on, we'll cut it and it'll have those concentric circles inside. And if it's not Daldinia, it'll be different. So we did a dissection and that's what we saw. So boom. Xylaria. Interesting that this could be new to science. So we've got the Xylaria people in the background doing a little dance. Sorry. 
apparently um, we're being told that they're very easy to grow in culture. Wonderful. So we can, John Durnley, um, the esteemed John Durnley is telling us we can grow it on agar very easily. So we should be able to get DNA out of it quite quite easily. Sorry, I have the specimen. No, no, I dried it very carefully at uh, 40 degrees. And, um, but the good thing is Patrick did a bit of spore work and that's what the spores like were like. So it was the spores that got us excited. Well, got the Xylaria people excited because uh, it's, and, and as you can see, the form is very different. Normally with Xylaria, they kind of have a, a longer, uh, more interesting form. So Laria, I guess the, co the, the, the colloquial term is dead man's fingers. So you think of like little fingers emerging from the from a dead piece of wood, but these were like round balls. So we were, so it was an exciting find, I think, for the day. And as exciting as it might be, it may not have a name yet. So we may not have a name to attach to it, but that's great that it could be an addition to scientific knowledge. All of this stuff happening on the day and Patrick did the spore work and they were very interesting as well too. So. Lovely. And then of course, the last thing was this Trimetes, which uh, I really stupidly obscured the cap with the number. It was right at the end of the four and someone found it and I was like, oh, bugger, it actually is a nice specimen and you know, quickly throw on a number and take, but I lost the cap, in, but incidentally it dried well. So we've got the, a good picture of the cap on the lives, on the dried specimen. So possibly Trimetes, uh, Matt said maybe Trimetes polyzona or another one. And I think last time we found Trimetes polyzonia, polyzona, it was around that area. So it might be the same specimen re-emerging uh, later in the year. So a few other nice little photographic opportunities on the day as well too. So terrific forays and great outcomes. And uh, even if we don't find a lot, it's always a great day out. And um, we'd always encourage you to come along. And the next forays we have coming up are also really exciting forays. So they'll be really good. Annie Hihia, Environmental Reserve. Um, Google it, you'll find nothing. And the reason is it's kind of really off the map. It's a recently donated piece of land to Sunshine Coast Council. It's been earmarked as an area of high conservation value. Judith and I have been out there three times now over the last two years. And we keep saying, wow, this place is awesome. It's a wonderful drive out to Peachester. So it's like as if you're driving out to Mullaney or Woodford and uh, you drive down River Road and you go across a lot of dirt road and uh, cattle grids and there's lots of cow poo around. So there's probably opportunities to observe coprophyllis fungus, which has always been a fascination of mine. And the site is just beautiful, really beautiful site. It's got rainforest, uh, sclerophyll, really interesting. So if you wanna come along, that'll be a really good one to come along to. And that's coming up very soon on the 22nd of May. So as ever, I send out the invitation, usually only a week out, of the foray. And I guess people get anxious, like I want to be on this foray and that foray. But I find the most efficient thing to do is one week out, because that's when you know that people are local and ready and available. And we always get a full uh, a full com component of people. So we only have capacity for 15 to 18 people, I would say. Parking is really limited, uh, but it, it's an amazing site. So I would suggest that this is a uh, one not to miss. And then Binnaburra, of course, on the 5th of June. Um, as you know, Binnaburra had that fire and was devastated. Uh, not last year, the year before. They lost so much, all of their residences. And then last year, the site was still uh, inaccessible early in the year. So we moved the foray out, thinking we'll go up there in April or May, and COVID hit. So we had to cancel the foray because of COVID last year. So we're really aching to get back up to Binnaburra. And Binnaburra, of course, is um, two and a half hours drive south from here, roughly, two hours maybe. 
and it's in the Gold Coast hinterlands. Uh, it, it is a it's a beautiful drive and a really lovely site. So again, sorry, I'm asked which walk are we doing. Um, I think we're still yet to have a look at which walk we'll do. We usually go up to uh, where people camp and there's a little walk near there. So there's a lot of area there to cover if you wanted to be zealous, but um, that'll be a brilliant day, I think. Binabara, incidentally, was the place we went to two years ago and we've always been on the lookout because we kind of in our pockets have these uh, things we've, you know, we want to find. The pink crepidotus is always a, a thing we're keeping our eyes out for. And in fact, why don't, oh, and Belthorpe's coming up. So, if I just, give you an indication about things we're trying to find. And they always are, of course, if it will perform. Crepidotus. So this is one of the hot things we're always looking for. And why Crepidotus? Because Sapphire is doing work on Crepidotus. So what is a crepidotus? A crepidotus is a little fleshy ear. And one of the indicators of a crepidotus, of course, is their brown spored. And that one there, you can't really see it, has kind of a dirtiness to the gills. So if you see a little fleshy paw, these ones are particularly big. That one's probably three to five centimetres across. So these are big crepidotus. They're not usually big, but little gilled ears and they're fleshy and they have brown spores. So if you ever see crepidotus, someone is doing work and someone wants a collection and certainly they want to see them. So post them on Facebook, say, should I make a collection? Naturally, we'll go, yes. And of course, agaricus, you wouldn't think so, but someone is doing work on agaricus as we speak. So if you see any agaricus, and by that I mean field mushrooms, um, because I guess what we know of was, you know, two or three species, agaricus bisporus, agaricus campestris. We know agaricus xanthodermis, the yellow stainer, but there should be more than that in agaricus. There should be dozens and dozens of species in agaricus in Australia. And the indication is that most agaricus species in Australia probably are undescribed. So again, if you see agaricus, we're looking for them. Especially in rainforests is what Fran is saying. Um, and with the lactarius, what I was talking about was this specimen at Binnaburra. Now with lactarius and rustula, Patrick is doing work on Lactarius and Russula. And we've always been looking for the green milked Lactarius. And we found it at Binnaburra, and this is it. So you'll see that when you, we initially did the incision, the milk is white. And this is just as the milk starts to turn. And after about 60 seconds, the milk turns an olivaceous green. And we made two terrific collections of that on the day. And Patrick was really thrilled because it's been one of those things which is on our radar. And of course, the other things that are on our radar are Marasmus because Fran is doing work in Marasmus. So um, when I think of Marasmus, this is what I typically think of. So people are always asking about in the field, what do I collect? What don't I collect? Um, so if you've got your finger on the pulse of mycology, you will know what are the, 
the hot items. And by hot items, I mean the stuff that people are working on currently. It's always good to collect because you never know. You could put stuff away in a herbarium and then in 20 years from now, someone could pick up what you've been depositing and then start to work on it. So it's always good to collect. But right now, uh, these are the ones that people are working on and that's Merasmus. So, you know, I guess uh, they were called horsehair fungus colloquially. Uh, we now know that their names, not because they have a thin stipe, but there is actually another type of Merasmus that this one's called Robust Brown is what Fran's telling me. So Merasmus collections, Agaricus collections, Crepidotus collections, they're all very interesting. And Binabara should be uh, a really good foray. So I'd welcome you all, or King Alfred's Cake, someone's telling me online. Welcome you all to join the foray. So if you're not on our email list, then email info at queenslandfungi.org.au. All of you should be. And uh, that's initially how we, we go out to ask you to come on a foray. Some people will say, oh, I get too many emails. And it's like, oh, too bad. Um, we used to put our invitations up for forays up on Facebook. But now by the time we email out, it's full and there's no real point to putting anything but the results on Facebook. So rather than say, hey, there's an event, there's a foray on on Facebook, by the time we get to Facebook, there's already 20 people coming. So that's become redundant, unfortunately. Um, so thank you everyone for listening. End the meeting there. <laughs>